I'm quite fortunate to have a lot of clients that have been with me for years. Um, so it's nice to kind of see also their journey and their evolution to the point they're at now. And, and it's good to have those kind of like, yeah, loyal, loyal clients. What do you do at that point? Like, especially when you've got dependents, like you've got your, your other half, you've got, you know, like uh, a kid and another kid on the way. I kind of thought like, yeah, that's it. Like I'm, I'm in shit now. I think, you know, I kind of took the positive out of a negative situation and I just kind of stopped stressing, focused on the birth of the baby. Like so much stress going on and said, look, at the end of the day, let's just focus on us. Mm. Whatever happens with the studio happens. I would always be trying to reach that unattainable goal, but I would never get there because I'm always trying to do more and more. And when I do get close, then I just stretch it higher and higher. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is a 21st Century Tattoo. Jay, Mr. Jay Best. How are you doing, man? Good, thanks. Happy to be here. Yeah, yeah no, it's sick. I mean, here we are in 60. I mean, I love this. This place is cool, man. Yes, really like it. I'm glad we could finally kind of catch up. Um, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to picking your brains a bit, you know. Yeah. Um, how long have you been in the industry now? Oof, a little while now, I'll probably say since 2010. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sick. So like a wealth of experience. I feel like also the industry's in even in like probably the last five years is really changing. So I'll be interested to kind of find out what you kind of have seen change so a lot in the industry. Yeah, definitely. We'll get on to that. I guess I would just want to know, let's let's start right at the beginning. Take Oof. me back <laughs> um as far as you can kind of remember really. Yeah. Um was tattooing always that the vision? No, at all. Uh tattooing weren't even yeah, weren't even a thought. I mean, I was interested in tattoos. I got my first tattoo at like 16. Mm. Um, I'm from Reading originally, so back there, they don't really care so much about age. But yeah, basically, um, I was always doing like portraits, that kind of stuff, mm. and uh, did like graphic design, as I think most people. And then um, what happened? A lot of people come to me and then ask for like tattoo designs, and... I would design it for them, but I think I didn't really understand what I was actually doing yeah. until you actually pick up the machine and start tattooing. Mm. Um, so, so it was yeah, like commissions and stuff you were doing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because so. people knew I could draw and stuff. So they're like, oh, could you design this up for me? And I think after a little while, like some of the studio started asking who was doing it. Mm. So I thought, okay, let me try and make a bit of money from this and go to studios with my designs. But everyone's like, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I think they had like, obviously the like old flash books and mm. I can't remember the name of them, but everyone just had the same flash that we're using pretty much. And I was heavily into like Chicano style. Yeah. So where were you getting the inspiration to draw that then? Because if you weren't actually in, within that kind of tattooing environment? Um, I think from like old artists like Mr. Cartoon, uh, Jose Lopez, yeah. like people like that, I would actually get tattoo magazines and see the very limited flash that was on Google and try and like replicate that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's mad. It's cool. I, th I think like, what do you think you kind of really pulled from that, ex from, from doing that? Like, I guess I want to know where that, that kind of interest in the Chicano style, particularly where, where did that kind of come from? I guess because I was always drawing like portraits and stuff it's it's kind of like under that same category, even though it's a bit more illustrative, mm. I wanted that smooth, like black and gray kind of mm. gangster look. And, you know, back then I wanted to move to LA, join a gang yeah. <laughs> and uh, just do Chicano tattoos and scripts and stuff. And plus uh, I was doing graffiti for a while as well. So yeah. it just felt a natural direction to go to. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting actually how many tattoo artists were like graph artists before, as well as kind of a graphics background. Yeah, yeah. Things kind of just tend to, uh, tend to marry up. Yeah, and I think it's difficult to kind of make money from that as well or make mm. a career out of it. Definitely not with graffiti unless you're really known. Um, and graphic design, I just couldn't find a job really. So yeah, I was just doing stuff on the side. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. I think it's it's literally, and it is cliche, but it genuinely is the best job for someone who kind of thinks the way we do to be able yeah. to kind of create that stuff. Definitely. Um, I know that's kind of, I didn't ever set out to be a tattoo artist, but okay. if you're that way inclined, it just makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Yeah, I think also there was a, I remember there was a point like when I came to London and I was just working in a restaurant and I was kind of like just working full time. And I was like, what, what was the point of me coming to London mm. if I'm just doing like exactly the same thing that I was doing back home? 
And um, I didn't even have time to draw and stuff really. So at that point I kind of fell out of love with drawing. And I remember I was just walking through Camden and there's like the bridge area there. I would always go there, turn around and come back, but literally go out there for like trainers and stuff. Oh, I see. Yeah. And then I remember um, one day I was like, oh, let me go over that bridge. So I went over that bridge and there was this uh, matey just drawing on a canvas mm. and uh, his name was Sonny. And then I was, got, uh, well, I started talking to him and then I, he said, uh, you know, what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm an artist, da, da, da. And then next thing, he invited me to an exhibition where I met the rest of his collective there. Yeah. Wow, okay. I went to that ex exhibition, showed them some of my work, and then literally I ended up becoming part of their collective. Mm -hmm. So like every weekend when I could, I'd be working in the stables, like Candom stables, uh, drawing on like t-shirts, customizing trainers, yeah, yeah, doing like airbrushing as well and things. And um yeah, it went well. And then actually there used to be this annual festival in Shoreditch every year uh, called Street Fest. I'm not yeah. sure if you heard of that. Okay. And like Adidas Originals kind of sponsored it and stuff. And mm. we'd be there like every year kind of um, promoting our work pretty much. It's mad how things work, isn't it? Like, Definitely, yeah. And you think if I hadn't have been there or had that conversation with that person. Exactly. Um, you obviously mentioned that you kind of grew up in Reading. Yeah. What was the decision to kind of come into London? Is that what did it? Is it the natural dead, thing dead, to do? Dead, dead. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing in Reading. I mean, if obviously people listening from Reading. They've got a nice Ikea. There. Say again? Ikea. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it wasn't there when I was there. No. Yeah, it was just like some burnt out building that uh, was yeah. just super dodgy. But thing is, um, you know, I go to Reading and visit like family and friends and they're still there. Mm. And my mate actually put it quite nicely, um, which I didn't really put it that way before, but he said, you know, you always aspire to do other things and get out of Reading. And I used to think like, well, this is him saying it. He's like, why do you think Reading is so small or like Reading's too small for you? Mm. And he said, at the end of the day, actually, you're too big for Reading. And that kind of stuck with me. And it's just like, it's a, it's a very nice thing to say. And I think when most people come to London, mm. they want a bit more in life. Yeah, 100%, yeah. man. It's not easy, but if you're passionate enough, then yeah, you can get it. Yeah. Well, yeah. mate, I mean, your passion has obviously got you, got you like so far you know like you've you've you're a you're a talented artist thank you you are like from what from my eyes at least you're a, like a real all-rounder um and yeah you've done some pretty cool shit in your in the last 10 years so we'll get into that in a yeah minute. yeah definitely. but i guess yeah let's talk about your tattooing sure um i would love to know really kind of like what and if you define your style um and how you kind of ended up at that point at least from chicano yeah yeah um, it's funny because yeah, with the Chicano style, I was kind of, like I said, naturally drawn to that. So it was always kind of fine line anyway, or doing bloodlines, you got your soft, like black and gray shades. Mm. And it was that whole kind of, I guess, gangster concept and stuff. And it, and it worked well with the lettering, yeah. with graffiti. Um, so I've always thought I was going to go towards that style. Um, and then I ended up working in this studio which is also another funny thing because it's actually the same studio Bint was at. Oh, I actually yeah, messaged yeah. him after I saw his uh, podcast. Oh, mad. Yeah. And uh, remember he said that he just packed up and left that studio. Mm. That was the studio I was at. Oh, okay. Yeah, super. Oh, shit. It's a super, small world. This yeah. industry, man. Everyone knows each other. Yeah, yeah. Super dodgy. And I, I messaged him and just said like, oh, you know, do you remember, like I was at the studio before, it's like, yeah, yeah, like, you know, so many things happened there, yeah. But um, that studio, although it was a bit dodgy and stuff, actually helped me in my career, because mm. I was still, well, if you take it back, actually, um, at the beginning, I was trying to get into the industry, and it's very difficult, because I think back then, it was quite secretive, like I guess a lot of people said, and I'll go Camden, like trying to, get an apprenticeship and it was just very difficult um and then what happened is i went to a friend of a friend mm. who was actually a, a tattoo artist um the new traditional stuff and yeah he showed me the basics and stuff and then there was this other guy that i used to work with when i was working in selfridges kind of had many jobs before yeah like as you as you do you got to kind of graft before you can actually transition over to like tattooing full-time yeah of course um so i was working in like all saints selfridges 
And, and this is, sorry, were you just pulling up your on that point? That was like kind of, you're doing a bit of this on the side yeah. until you can get to the point where you can do your tattooing full time. Yeah. Yeah. Even before that, like this was still like at drawing stage, mm. but I wanted to like get into actually tattooing because more people are saying, oh, you should do it. Um, and I was afraid of needles. So I was like, I don't know if I can do that on anyone, but let's see. And I remember this guy, he gave me this book and it was like the A to Z of tattooing. Yeah. From like, I think Huck Spalding from like the seventies. And I was reading that and it was just so retro, but it gave me um, kind of an insight to the industry. Mm. Um, so I was reading that alongside working um, or getting knowledge from this neo-traditional artist. Um, and then, yeah, things didn't um, plan out as expected because a, a guy I was working with was going to open a studio and I would have uh, been there, but then it, that didn't go through. Yeah. So that didn't happen. The artist moved away somewhere else and then uh, I was left by myself. So at that point, I was kind of tattooing fake skin, tattooing oranges, tattooing all my legs and everything yeah. like that. But I had a line of people that wanted to get stuff done because they knew my my drawings, but I was just like, nah. And you're like, you're kind of, what you've been left kind of to it at this point. Yeah, yeah. It sounds really similar to me, to be fair. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people kind of went that way, but just because it was so difficult to get anyone to show you the the right way. Yeah. And um, I think you need to, this is what I kind of talking to Claudio about before. It's almost like you need to obsess over it. And like literally everything was just tattooing. Like in my spare time, I was doing drawings. Yeah, you have yeah. to You have to just kind of learn it yourself, don't exactly, you? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and like fast track it. Yeah. That's the same. And, and you find then you're, you're like taking everything on. Yeah. You're working all the hours of the, do you know what I mean? Exactly, the sun. yeah. But, you know, it pays off, doesn't it? Yeah, it does pay off. I mean, it's it's definitely not easy and it's it's not such a, a quick career mm. to get into. Or it wasn't, let's say. Nowadays it's a bit different. But, yeah, at the end of the day, like, you need to kind of graft and put in uh, to get something back out of it. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so that kind of happened. And I was adamant that I didn't want to tattoo anyone until I felt comfortable enough that it was good enough to go on someone's skin. I just remember like when I tried doing it on myself as well, like I literally freehanded this intricate calligraphy um, <laughs> letter as you <laughs> nice do. And simple. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it was upside down, uh, almost back to front. And I was trying to do it. And I remember just doing it and like hand was shaking. And I tried to like put the line in, did it, wiped it. And it wiped half the, the Sharpie off Fuck. and it didn't even go in. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I had to like redo it and it took like, I don't know, two hours just to do like simple things. Were you shown anything? Like Yeah, briefly, briefly. What? But um, again, I didn't want to put it in anyone before I was like comfortable enough that it's good enough for myself. Yeah. Yeah, so I was, I was well, just doing that. It's the right attitude to have, isn't it? You know what I mean? I, I think yeah. I kind of got shown how to use and set up a coil machine. Sure. And then maybe, yeah, I think I did an orange and a piece of fake skin and then it was like, there you go. So oh, that's it, just two that things. That was it. And then it was very kind of hands off and I ended up doing the same thing. That shop owner disappeared. I yeah, got yeah. left to basically run the place, mm. sort the bills out. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm trying to learn to tattoo here and now I'm having to like try and run the shop. Yeah. And like, I, do you know what I mean? And I think like you said, because it was quite kind of, I mean, it's still in, in some elements it isn't regulated, but like, mm -hmm they know that it's like free labor almost. And there was always, there was some dodgy shop owners. Yeah. And unfortunately it's not, not so much like that now. It's just a shame for like all those poor victims that <laughs> you did I at know. the beginning, but without those people, then you wouldn't be who you are today as well. Yeah. You'd hope and think maybe kind of people coming into the industry now, um, might be getting a slightly, I mean, they're probably getting a different experience. I know that for sure. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's so much information out there now maybe even too much so people can get a bit overwhelmed and lost. Mm. Um, but I mean, after I did that and I did start doing a few people, I did look for an apprenticeship still and I worked somewhere for six months. Um, wasn't really learning much, but it kind of uh, almost justified and clarified what I was doing was right anyway yeah. in terms of health and safety because that was a big part for me. Mm. I didn't want to, um, let's say, infect someone or do anything like that, a bit dodgy. Yeah, um, scar someone up or something. That can happen, yeah. <laughs> but I didn't want it to kind of like come back to me and just like have that negative effect. But yeah, after that, actually I already tattooed someone before that 
and it actually came out okay. Mm. And I was quite happy with it, but I thought I need more guidance here. So that's why I did that for six months, left that, and then I worked in that dodgy shop. Yeah. yeah. It seems like all of those early experiences in studios like that, it, that is what kind of, yeah, really gives you the foundation. Um, you know, it's your bread and butter doing all those walk-ins and stuff. Yeah. Um, do you still like doing that sort of thing now? And do you have the, do you do walk-ins or and what's your kind of, your, your thing that you're kind of trying to focus on? Well, I mean, the thing is back then I got to a point where I was doing like six to eight tattoos a day, almost six days a week. And I, I had enough, like I burnt out. Um, yeah. So I just, I left everything altogether, uh, went traveling for like a year and just didn't really tattoo as well. But then I came back to London, um, ready to kind of tattoo again. And then I started doing a completely different style. Mm. So I was getting some like walking stuff, but I think back then was Facebook. Everyone was doing advertising and like Facebook pages and stuff like that. Yeah. It's mad how it switched. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So yeah, I was getting a lot of work through that, but then the shop I was working at, the guy said, right, um, I know you do this, but I want you to kind of specialize in geometric stuff and watercolor. Mm. And I was just like, that's complete opposite to what I'm used to. Like, you know, pulling those lines and stuff. Like, I've done a few, but you know, with Chicano stuff or what I was doing, you can get away with just quickly passing over the line. It's all about the shading, but mm. with the geometric stuff, it's like everything has to, to be, be precise. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I um, almost enjoy, I enjoy cre creating stuff like that. Though. I like that challenge. Yeah, you know, it challenges like, yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think a big thing for me at the beginning was kind of just the whole machine setup. I had like the, uh, the old coils like Mickey Sharps and yeah. um, I actually, again, intensely researched what all the Chicano artists were using and actually like got a machine made for that. Mm. Yeah. What um, was your, or what are you using now? What, what were you kind of, Now I've gone to Cheyenne wireless pen, Yeah. but I'm thinking about changing it soon, but only because it was like the first wireless um, machine. Mm. And then also uh, Dan Cuban I bought. Yeah. So do you still use lines. a mix of boat coil and rotary? And yeah, but it's, it's long to set up the Dan Cuban um, in terms of, like obviously when you've got a pen, you just click it in, yeah, sell it, wrap yeah. it up and that's it. Yeah. But with the Dan Cuban, you've got to have like the power supply, the clip cord, all that kind of stuff yeah. that I've foot, been used, I used to have for a foot years. pedal. Yeah, same, you know same I mean? as well. like, And I think yeah. now I wouldn't even know what I was doing with the foot pedal. I'm exactly. so used to just on and off. It's like you've got to carry an extra suitcase just to, yeah. just to bring that machine. Um, yeah. It's like it's... I mean, I, I'm like massively respect people who are like loyal to the coil. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, I just, I couldn't be, it's that faff. Yeah, I've kind of I've gone through it and I feel like I got to a point where I set it up like my shader to be super soft, mm. probably like the, the smoothest shader I, I had, like even better than the shine that I use now. Um, and the liner was always just giving me problems, mm. like setting it up to hit right. And because I was doing like fine lines plus thick lines, I felt like I always had to like change it and switch it up. But um, there was one machine that I got, which was from LA, I think. Um, and that was called Bloodhound Iron, okay. which I still got now. It's got a bit Not rusty. Either. Yeah, it was this guy called Jeff, uh, Jeff something. And yeah. he basically like was doing stuff for, I think, Jose Lopez and uh, a lot of the artists that were doing that style. So I managed to get a machine of him. And I saw him at conventions and stuff and he remembered me and I thought, you know, it's quite nice. Like he's like a fairly known like machine builder, but it's nice that he actually kind of acknowledges you and stuff. But I'm always trying to look for like the best machine that would make the job better or a bit more efficient, I'd yeah. say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, little word about some of my favorite cartridges from Ghost, these are the Nano. And obviously as the name suggests, they're designed for a lot of the finer work. These go all the way down to a 0 0.18 mil up to a 0.35. Now the ones I've got here are a three liner in the 0.2 and a one liner in the 0.25. Make sure you go and grab yourself some exclusively from Star. If you use the code ATFCT10, you'll get 10% off as well. I guess what I really want to know, like, what what is what's the main thing that you're trying to convey with your work? Like, what's integral to you? What's that kind of core value for you with tattooing? Um, is it is it the equipment? Is what is it? So I think now, like, having changed studios and stuff like that, like I realized going around and getting out my bubble that a lot of people have their niche, mm. and I feel like I was kind of known for a particular style but I kind of outgrew it at the same time. Mm. 
which was the fine line stuff, but I wanted to do more with it. And I also felt that I had not, not too much range, but I was given too many options. So now I'm trying to refine that a bit more and combine in like the fine line stuff with the bold line stuff, but make it a little bit abstract. So it's not the same mm. each time. Um, so I, I'll probably say like, yeah, something, something like that. Which yeah. keeps it quite open. Yeah. It's cool, man. And I think that's what I like. Like I can really appreciate an artist kind of dedicating themselves to one style. Your kind of, when you say style, I mean, your, your style kind of shines through in your work, but, yeah. um, it's really, it's good to see. And it's something that I kind of try and do as well. Is just try and give a bit of everything. Yeah. Um, I'm very fortunate that I get such like a mixed bag of kind of inquiries and I'll always try and, and do as much, as many different styles as possible, you know, because yeah, I, I don't want to, I don't, I almost get like, I don't want to pigeonhole myself. Exactly. And I think it, it kind of keeps you on your toes. And, and again, I appreciate people that, that do do their style and that's, that's up to them. But I just think me personally, even in life, like I, I like to try different things mm. and, keep evolving and then yeah just fine tuning what mm. i do yeah, yeah. Sick. if you're enjoying the podcast this week don't forget to leave us a rating and a review wherever you listen to your podcasts it really helps the podcast grow yeah okay so i guess one thing i really want to know can you pinpoint maybe uh, like one experience or one like real life lesson that you maybe learned on your journey as a tattoo artist that's kind of got you and helped you to get to here hmm um I think not one particular experience, but I would say definitely like just experiences in my own personal life uh, that I've had to deal with that could, well, I've gone through a lot of stuff basically. And sometimes like it can be quite difficult to tattoo or talk or concentrate about certain things. Mm. And I feel like, um, yeah, like just having to tattoo anyway, just to, to graft to obviously pay the bills and stuff. It helps sometimes that you're there one-on-one -on -one with a client and you can actually share experiences with them. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like a therapy session for them and for you. Yeah, yeah. so true. And it is, what do you, what do you get from, from, from that then that tattooing? Yeah, I think it's, it's such an intimate thing that you wouldn't necessarily uh, meet someone on the street or someone that you don't really know and share like mm. so much detail with them. And I feel like, um, when it happens organically, it's nice. Like sometimes some people could just be like, oh, they just want to come and get a tattoo and that's it. Uh, other people, you start talking about something and you realize you relate with them and it just goes deep. And then yeah. you end up talking about situations that you're going through or situations they're going through or alternate realities and, you know, yeah. just kind of stuff like that. And, um, then the people leave and then, and then that's it. And then, you know, most of the times they end up coming back mm. and you just pick up from where you you've left off. And I think I'm quite fortunate to have a lot of clients that have been with me for years. Mm. Um, so it's nice to kind of see also their journey and their evolution to the point they're at now. Mm -hmm. And and it's good to have those kind of like, yeah, loyal, yeah, it's loyal sick, clients. Yeah, yeah, you're like, you're seeing each, you're watching each other growing, isn't it? Exactly. It's yeah. also the thing that blows my mind and still does to this day is the amount of trust people put in you. Yeah. Like, like you said, people kind of just off the, like not off the street, but you know, like people that you just don't know and then they're in, they're instantly trusting you for hours, you know? Um, I think that's kind of down to confidence as well though, because I remember at the beginning when I was, I'm in an hour and a lot, then people obviously lose confidence in you. Um, but if you know what you're going to do or the direction you're going to go and you can kind of convey that to them, then they, they can relax a bit and give you, um, more trust pretty much. Yeah. Do you tend to find your clients give you a lot of freedom with the design? Um, is there anything that you kind of really say no to and stay away from? Yeah, I feel like, um, I used to do a lot of, well, if that I, made sense. Yeah, no, no, it did, <laughs> did. Um, I used to do a lot of consultations before, but then I kind of limited it because I just didn't have the time like so much. So I try and do a lot of the stuff over email, but then for example, if it's a bigger piece, I'll have a consultation. And, um, even like today, for example, like the guy saw some of the work that I'd done previously, but he didn't really have an idea of what he wanted to do. Mm. And I thought he was going to go for more geometric like heavy sleeve which I was fine to do but I was kind of started I took a picture of his arm and luckily the iPad as well helps with this um and I just started like saying about the anatomy and you know the way it can flow and all this kind of stuff and I was like right you can go with this option 
literally I do it so loosely, it's just circles and lines. It's like you can go with this option or you can go with this option here. Actually, there's one more. Actually, there's one more option. So I gave him like four or five options. Yeah. And that's just the layout. So I feel like sometimes I give too much. Um and then they kind of get overwhelmed. But with, with how much choice there is. Exactly. But yeah. then I, I kind of reined it in a bit and said, okay, right, let's work out elements that you want to put in there. Mm. And um in the end, long story short, we managed to like refine it down to like a bird with this other geometric stuff and then this other thing that means something to his family and his his kids and stuff and stuff like that. And I showed him some references and he's like, Yeah, I like the way this is and I like that Dali piece you done there. So we kind of it's like a collaboration, basically. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, it's definitely always easier to do in person. Do you prefer to kind of draw with the client on the day um, or do you do a lot of designing beforehand? If it's um, if it's a big piece, then yeah, I've had that consultation with them and then I'll email them back and forth and then I'll show them stuff on the day um, and I'm still open to making adjustments and that. Mm. Like never over email do I send anything because it's like, I've had problems in the past from doing that. Um where they've had a bit too much time to kind of look at things and too many opinions Just from other people. It. Yeah. 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 I was having that. I, this kind of a, like a recurring theme and I've had that conversation with a couple of, couple of guests before and it's mm-hmm. so true. Like you almost, yeah, you can have to, I mean, I know I'd be the same with a design. Do you know what I mean? I, yeah. I would just overthink it and there almost there's something quite magical in the spontaneity of tattooing. I exactly. Think. Um, and that's what oh, I always kind of don't want to sit on a design for too long yeah, because I will just overthink it. I think also, yeah, that would be me overthinking it because I'll give four different options as well, but then I'll try and refine it a bit more. But at the same time is um, I would tell from the person's reaction on the day, like usually I give a couple options yeah, and if they don't like it, you'll tell straight away. And if they do like it, then it's like, it's good. And if they don't, I would never force them to get it. I'll be like, okay, what can we adjust? Um, and make it work for them because obviously it's it's your name that's getting put out there but at the same time it's going to be on their skin so you've got to kind of appreciate that yeah. as well and I guess you've kind of perfectly summed up what I was trying to explain in that in the question you know there um, is like trying to create that balance yeah um, yeah man yeah <laughs> yeah that's it it's cool um, so yeah Matt ten, over 10 years in the industry now yeah um, would you have done anything differently Hmm. I think um, maybe I would have gone around busier studios. I think that might have helped, like just learning different techniques and things like this. Um, at the beginning, like I said, like I was learning by myself. Um, I was in that dodgy shop by myself pretty mm. much. And then I moved into a small studio where I learned a bit, but not a huge amount. But it did help, I'll probably say more business side of things mm-hmm. um, as opposed to actually like tattoo and technique. But I think, yeah, if I had maybe like guessed it about a bit more or if I had um, kind of worked in busier shops, then maybe I'll pick up something a bit quicker. But I like kind of left the shop and opened my own shop in 2014, mm-hmm. no, 2016. Is this 11-11? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I opened that in 2016. That was more because uh, of my eldest as well. I just wanted to be close, close to home. And, um, you know, she was getting sick quite a lot back then. So I just didn't want it being an inconvenience at the shop I was at. And I was quite busy at that shop. Yeah. So, yeah, I kind of looked for a place closer and then opened that up. And it was more just like a, a kind of private space for myself. But Talk to me, because I was doing a bit of research. Talk to me a little bit about how that kind of came to be. Were you kind of, was it a bit of a coffee shop as well you had going? Uh, yeah, that was the last the last venture okay. in it as well, yeah. Um, so oh, yeah. That's part of the same thing? Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So basically um, what it was was literally a space just for me to tattoo, but uh, it actually had like quite a big space in the front room. Mm. So the tattooing was at the back and it had like big, I mean, kind of like this as well, like big open windows, natural light coming through. Um, and it was just kind of like my own little oasis. Mm. And then people started getting interested, like artists working. I was like, okay, yeah, like, you know, come in this space. Uh, some some of them worked out well, others didn't. But, you know, you kind of go over that. It's a pretty process. Is. Yeah. Exactly. I, 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 yeah. I don't think that probably ever ends as a, as a yeah. studio owner. It's probably one of the perks of not owning a studio and yeah. not having to less, deal with that. Less stress. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. I think um, it's mainly like just the trust and communication, I think is like a key part of that. Yeah. 
but anyway, um, yeah, so I had like the front room free for, for years and it was just kind of like a reception area. Mm. Um, and then I think when COVID hit, that was, that was the thing that I kind of thought like, right, I wasn't working and, you know, I was getting a, a bit of money like here and there, but yeah, I was just kind of like, no one knew how long it would last and I didn't know if it would survive. Um, but it was survive COVID and um, that was all good. But I kind of thought like, right, in case we go into, I think, a third wave, because after the second wave, it was just getting long. But it was. Yeah. <laughs> after the fucking first week, it was getting long. Exactly. Yeah. I, well, I mean, to be fair, I needed a break. I mean, obviously, it's yeah, it's a bad situation. It's, and unfortunately, nothing happened to me or any close ones. Um, mm. But yeah, I kind of needed that break because I was just flat out all the time. And I had so many things that I needed to get on top of. And I managed to do a lot and spend more time like with family and stuff and uh, I think the first lockdown like I needed it let's say second lockdown yeah it was just it was getting too long yeah yeah, yeah it was a tricky one I mean I opened my studio in 2020 Ooh. which was like first lockdown yeah but yeah again very fortunate to have not been or not had any close family members or anything like, yeah, yeah. dramatically affected by it but yeah, what a, what a mad time. Yeah, it's a difficult time to open that. Yeah, but have had the time to open and then where would where would I have found that time were it not for COVID? Sure. So it's like, it's a tricky one. And I guess if you can if you can prove that you can keep it going during COVID, then, you know, you're kind of on, onto something. Yeah, I mean, nothing's happened like that ever before, as, as far as I know, anyway, in my lifetime. Um, so it's definitely a test to see like if you could survive through it and especially like in a tattoo industry anyway, it's not like um, such a necessary thing. It's more like a privilege to, to get a tattoo because there's other priorities before that. Yeah, that's it. It so, makes you, makes you realize, you know what I mean? How, how like lucky we are. Yeah. I was, I was very grateful that, you know, people are leaving deposits and stuff and that people are just coming back. Mm. So yeah, I, I appreciate like every day that I can tattoo um, thanks to the, the clients that are interested but yeah, like with, um, with that happening, uh, I, I didn't know if there was going to be a third wave. So I was like, I have this space in the front, let me try and do something with it. And I was toying around with the idea for coffee, like a little while before, but I just had like similar to here as well, the Nespresso machine. Mm. Um, and I thought, I don't have a clue about coffee. <laughs> I don't <laughs> drink no coffee. Like coffee no, shop. exactly. I don't drink coffee. I don't even drink hot drinks because it's too long to drink. Even soups is just like, I get bored halfway through it. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, um, you know, people are coming in with a coffee in their hand all the time. So maybe I can kind of keep that here. And yeah. also the vibe that we've created because me and my other half, we painted the studio during lockdown. So we kept busy with that. Did massive murals and stuff in there. Mm. Um, so I was like, I think I saw, did I see some of those bits possibly? Possibly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was kind of like, how can I get people in here still mm. that don't necessarily want a tattoo or can't really afford a tattoo because of COVID and stuff like that? Um, so yeah, I looked, I looked at doing coffee. I spoke to my landlord and said, look, I'm thinking about doing this here. It was going to be after six years, um, a rent renewal. Actually, I think it's five years at that point, uh, five and a half years. And I was mm. like, okay, we're going to do a rent renewal. Um, are you happy with how it's going? Are you going to put the price up a lot more? And he's like, no, I think it'd be fine. Um, not going to put it up too much. Yeah. And I was like, okay, because I'm thinking about this idea. He said, yeah, yeah, it'd be a really good idea. Go ahead. So I was like, okay, let me, let me start doing it. So I, I did all the council stuff, paid all the fees. Like, I feel like um, with the tattoo industry as well, mm. Like I said previously, you kind of need to obsess over it. So with coffee, like when I do something, I do it properly. So I, I literally obsessed over it to the point where I was working, but then I'll come back from work and literally be watching a barista like yeah. in real time, <laughs> just yeah. doing coffees like until I fell asleep. And then I'll be researching all these coffee brands, coffee machines, everything, um, going around drinking coffee that I didn't like. Um, and then, yeah, doing all that stuff just so I kind of had an understanding of, of how it works. Cause I've, I've worked in a restaurant for years, like yeah. five years. Um, but I never did coffees and stuff like that. So it was a whole different world. Yeah. And, um, actually there was, there was a few nice coffee shops that actually gave me, um, a lot of help. Mm. Like they gave me a lot of like information and stuff. And I was kind of like, why are you telling me 
this stuff. Like, what do you want out of it? And they didn't want anything. Um, and then I kind of realized and understood the difference between like specialty coffee shops and Starbucks and chains like that and, yeah. and girls, um, which I just, I, I didn't have any interest in it before, you know, but like I said, I feel like if I'm going to invest, not even my money, just my time and myself, yeah. because then I'm sacrificing time with family and time, um, doing other things that I could be doing, mm. it needs to be worth that time I'm putting in. I need to get something back out of it. Yeah. But like, what is life worth if it's not spent like learning and exactly, you know I mean? yeah. trying to improve? I think yeah. it's like, there's obviously quite a recurring theme about how you, you know, you obsess over something mm. and, and really try and perfect it. Yeah. Um, it's really cool to see. It's very similar to me, man. It can be a good and bad thing at the same time, but I feel like, you know, most people that if you're that driven yeah. and with, with Claudio as well, like I feel like, you know, it's it's nice to to have that drive and you can kind of see the end goal and mm. there can be other hiccups on the way and stuff, but then it's just kind of how you deal with it. And I feel like I kind of, I was comfortable with my bubble, like with the tattoo industry and stuff. I didn't, again, I didn't go out there so much. I didn't know, I knew of people, but I didn't really know of so many people and people maybe see me around, but don't really know me. Um, but I thought, yeah, coffee, that's what I'm going to be focused, um, or focus all my energy on. Mm. And, um, I found out as well, my other half was, was pregnant. Uh, I think it was July last year. Mm. So after that, that's when I messaged the landlord. I was like, okay, right. I need to start planning the future because I don't usually plan six months ahead, to be honest. Um, and I was like, right, I need to open coffee shop by end of this year. Uh, January, we can start like, you know, um, focusing more on baby and getting stuff ready. Mm. And then I can kind of not relax, but everything will run itself. So I managed to push for it. I opened up in November, the coffee shop in the front. Uh, I spent a lot more money than I expected because like an espresso machine is ridiculous. Yeah. And money. you want to do it properly. I wanted to do it properly, but I thought I could kind of like blag it a bit, but you can't. <laughs> because people know as well. Yeah. And, and when I was, I went to a coffee festival and I was just so overwhelmed with like how much there is involved in it. And it's just like, I couldn't, I couldn't buy like a, an expensive espresso machine or I couldn't buy um, like a secondhand cheaper machine just because it wouldn't be able to deal with the volume. And everyone was looking like everyone had this certain brand, which was like a minimum of 10 K for the machine. I was just like, a couple of years before that, actually before lockdown, I wanted to spend that money on a classic car because I'd, I okay. just wanted like something to kind of show for my work all the time. So I was really yeah. looking into what that. What were you looking at? Uh, poor man's uh, Aston Martin. So there was like MG, MBMT, GMT, I think it's called. What was that, like an old DB5? Yeah, it looks similar to that, like similar shape, okay. like forest green would have been okay. epic. That racing green or something? Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. it. And um, I would have spent money on that, but... It wasn't really practical, to be honest, as well. And plus, I got you know kids, yeah, like kids, huge yeah. Around, yeah. Maybe yeah. in the future, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah. So I had that money kind of saved, um, and I just thought, okay, well, go for it, and just spent all my money on that machine and um, the fit out, which took forever. And my dad's a builder as well, so he helped me do it. But literally, was grafting like up until the end of the year. Um, yeah, so I managed to open in November. Um, it started like serving properly in December by January, it was already like getting a regular income Yeah, and I was literally working. Um, I was doing barista training. I was a barista as well. So I was working like from seven in the morning till like three, had a couple other people working there as well to help. Uh, but then from three till nine, I'll be tattooing pretty much four or five days a week. That was my, Flatter. that was my life. Yeah. And then how's, how's that all going now? Is it? <laughs> well, so then it came to January, uh, and I was like, right, we need to renew the lease in Feb, March or something like that. And he's like, yeah, I changed my mind. I'm going to give it to my son. I was like, oh, okay. Well, that's just like messed up literally everything because even with coffee and stuff, you need to have a turnover for at least about a year before you actually start making any profit. So we, so it was just a year, how many, so the contract six had months. come to an end? Really? Yeah, yeah. Like, so it was six months. Yeah. So I spoke to him in July, January. I mean, from July, he agreed everything was fine up until January. Yeah. Opened up properly. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to give it to my son. Contract oh. ended like end of Feb. So I was just like, oh, that's good. You know, this is the time where I'm supposed to be like 
That, mate, that is, how pregnancy. are you so calm, mate? That would finish me off. Oh, I've had many, many experiences in life that maybe another podcast because it's just too long. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that's not the worst thing that's happened to me. But I feel like with these things that happen to you, like they, they do kind of test you and stuff. And it's like, what do you do at that point? Like, especially when you've got dependents, like you've got your, your other half, you've got, you know, like uh, a kid and another kid on the way. I kind of thought like, yeah, that's it. Like I'm... I'm in shit now. Um, mm. But then, you know, it's you good that I was out. able to speak to my other half and we, we kind of tried to make up a plan. Uh, we were desperately looking for like another spot. Yeah. Couldn't find anything that would come up. And then I was actually arguing with the landlord, had to get solicitors involved and all that kind of stuff. So one thing I would say to anyone listening is make sure you actually got like a solicitor or, you know, someone that knows the legal system a bit better because... For me, I was just trying to look for a space to tattoo in, yeah. but there's the whole other, other like business side behind it and stuff. And you can easily get caught out with like things like this and loopholes. And I remember he made me sign away my rights to actually get the place and all the solicitors were like, oh, you shouldn't have done that. Blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, but you know, I thought, um, I'll give it the benefit of the doubt. And then, you know, he'll be a good person and just say, oh yeah, I'll give you this amount of notice and we'll part ways. But you think that's as not well, business yeah. now when you go into it as well if you're not if you're not aware like it doesn't happen all the time but yeah. it can happen and it's also quite sneakily the way it can be done yeah um, no one prepares you for it they don't thing. they don't at all and it's like yeah you sometimes you've got to learn the hard way exactly um, do you know what I mean um, yeah a solicitor is the way forward for sure yeah do you definitely think, I feel like there might be quite just kind of going back to what you were talking about COVID as well. I feel like the tattoo industry, there's a lot more kind of private studios opening oh, up yeah, now. Definitely, yeah. And maybe kind of get your thoughts on why you think that might be. Um, but I feel like with, with these kind of new business, a lot more businesses kind of popping up, um, private studios, um, it's something that I guess people just need to kind of like watch out for, you know, is there anything else maybe that you kind of, um, struggle with, um, while kind of doing that, that you'd maybe give some advice on? I mean, with that whole situation, it's kind of my, my mental health. And in the end, to be honest, like it was just so stressful. And mm. I thought, yeah, like having the coffee, like you said about with opening uh, the other private studios, I think having the coffee kind of like, I wasn't the first person to do it, but I think the way I did it kind of worked out well. Um, it gave that other option that another studio maybe didn't have. So that would have kept me like busy and stuff as well and bring in people that necessarily didn't want a tattoo or were intimidated by a tattoo studio and they come in, have a coffee and like, oh, this is a nice vibe. Like it's very bohemian here, you know, yeah. maybe I'll get a tattoo and then they look that way. So um, even people opening their own little private studios, I didn't feel like I was really affected that much. Mm. I feel like with this whole situation, it was literally down to me and the landlord pretty much. But I think, you know, we, I kind of took the positive out of a negative situation and I just kind of stopped stressing focused on the birth of the baby because we didn't have good news with that as well that was another part that was going on um and we just had loads like so much stress going on and said look at the end of the day let's just focus on us mm. whatever happens with the studio happens let's get a little extension so we can prepare you know to get rid of the coffee machine and you know put the stuff in storage and stuff like that and see what the future holds. And then that's when I started looking at studios and uh, guesting and stuff and, you know, looking to, to work somewhere like yeah. for, a, for a longer period. Yeah, yeah. Well, mate, you've like, you've landed on your feet, you know, this is a, this is a cool, it, it must be cool to kind of work here as well, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, right in the, right in the middle of London. Um, really sick. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, massive respect to, to your kind of determination, you know, like I said, you're, you've like, you're a lot calmer than I would be. I'd, yeah. I can say, I'd be gr I'm going gray as it is. Yeah. 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 It's bad. <laughs> but I wanted to say congratulations as well. Oh, thank on the, you. On, on the birth of the little one. Yeah, uh, yeah. How old are they now? Uh, 11 months now. So it's gone by months. so quick. Yeah. I actually have a book where it's just like you write in each year how things are. And I think after, I think after I got the news, maybe like, Midway through January, I kind of stopped writing in the book because it was all depressing, like with all that <laughs> stuff last year. But I was looking in it like yesterday and it's just funny to see how different, like in a different stage that I'm in. Mm. And I always say like, I never know where I'll be this time next year or something big would have happened or something like that. But um, even before that was happening, I remember seeing like Claudio 
doing this place up yeah. and like putting the resin floor in there. And I was just like, I haven't really seen another studio put that much effort in, like kind of we did, because we painted all the walls up and everything as well. Yeah. Um, well, hearing how this used to look. Yeah, now, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal, you know? Exactly. So I was like, yeah, that's that's epic. Like I'd like to visit it anyway. And this is still when I have my studio. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, kind of looked at guest spots and then this was one of the places and I met Claudia and I thought, you know, there was a good vibe and good energy there because I feel like the the place or the owner needs to reflect the place as well and mm. kind of, you know, if you if you vibe with them, then, you know, it's it's a good kind of place to work in. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's so important. Is that would be it's kind of my it would be my make up make or break, you know, if I was going to work somewhere. Is that what you would say would be your thing? What would you what would you look for in a studio um if you were to go to guest there, you know? Yeah. What what would make that experience for you? I mean first I kind of looked at the the work that people were doing and I kind of yeah definitely looked at the studio aesthetic and thought like oh where could I kind of fit in or where would people come and visit me? Um that's well maybe similar to what I was doing but it's, it's different in its own way um and I just kind of looked at the I think I looked at the best or like most popular places in London at the time because again I was in my own little bubble so I didn't need to kind of even acknowledge that yeah yeah so I thought now's a good time to kind of like you know choose these studios mm. and yeah I think I worked in like six seven one uh, studios and most people offered me a position which I was quite happy about mm. Um, but yeah, like him and, and Femme Fatale, I just felt like, uh, no, sorry, not him here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here in Femme Fatale, I felt like, um, the owners were like just really nice. And I felt like I was in a similar wavelength to them and similar vibe. And yeah, I kind of thought, okay, right. Let me, let me adjust my plans and try and, you know, work something out. Yeah. Work in there. Yeah. yeah, nice, bro. Yeah. Obviously, you, you kind of you split your time between here and obviously Grace's place. Yeah. Patel. Um, what's it like working with Grace? Yeah, she's cool. Like she's super chilled, and I think it's so different to this studio as well. And that's what I kind of wanted, like mm. two completely different places. Um, but yeah, like she's she's chilled. Like I briefly met her years ago, but mm. again, we didn't really speak properly until I actually did the guest spot there, and then um, yeah, then that that was it. Yeah, I don't think um. I don't even think with, with 60 as well, like 60 and Femme, I didn't plan anything ahead of guesting. But mm. I think when I met them, then I was like, yeah. It these are, happens organically. Yeah, exactly. These are the places I'd I would like to go to. Yeah. yeah. I feel like me and you are going to see a bit more of each other as well. Oh, yeah. Obviously we're going to be. Oh, yeah, yeah. In Brighton. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool, man. I could literally just sit and talk to you for ages. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess we'll, we'll go on to a little bit about what your kind of vision is going to be for the future. Mm. Um, but what I would love to do really is just kind of, um, let's have a chat up quickly about uh, Just Tattoo of Us. Sure. Um, series four? Uh, I was in, I think they did five series. I think I was in, no, I did series two, three, and four. Two, three, and four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. talk to me about getting on the show and, and how you found that. I mean, that was an experience, definitely, yeah. Um, so what it was, uh, and I, I kind of briefly spoke to you about it before. Yeah. I think I was at a convention somewhere and somebody come up and they had this idea about doing that show. Uh, I don't think it even had a name then, but it was like, oh, yeah we're going to do this show where couples design stuff for each other, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, okay, that sounds cool. And then I think they called me up the next day and they're like, okay, yeah, like what funny tattoos have you done? And what this kind of thing have you done? And I was just like, it's not really the kind of thing that I do or people don't really come in for like funny jokey tattoos. They're coming for like serious, like big cover ups and scar tattoos and stuff like that. So I was like, I don't think it's right for me. And I left that. And then, um, yeah, I hadn't watched anything and I think it came up, well, when they was getting ready to do the second series and uh, back then, I mean, I, I always had a problem with Instagram. I feel like Instagram is just like up and down for me all the time. And I remember I was getting frustrated at Instagram for some reason. I was like, all right, I'm going to delete, <laughs> I'm going to delete my Instagram because I just had enough of it. Mm. And I was getting a lot of work through Google anyway, like coming in that way and through my website. And I was like, right, I'm going to delete it tomorrow got a message pop up in my inbox and uh, it was this random person that was like, oh, we're looking to do this. Would you be interested? I was like, it looks a bit spammy to me, but yeah, I'll, I'll reply back. So I replied back and then thought, okay, we'll give you a call. 
I was like, okay, cool. So they gave me a call and then, um, yeah, we were speaking on the phone. Like, oh, we're looking to do this. Have you watched the show? I was like, not really. Mm. So then I researched it and I was like, oh, okay, yeah. Like, And I think, yeah, like I said, because Callie, Callie Joe was on there. Um, I think we had been Facebook friends, but never really spoken. But since I started my tattoo career, so I was like, yeah, she's quite established. Like if she's on it, then it'd be like a fairly decent thing. Um, and then, yeah, like spoke on the phone again. I think I had like a phone interview. And it's like, quite okay. a long process, isn't it? It was very long. I didn't expect it to be like that scale. Um, had the phone interview. Then I had to go into MTV. Um, and I remember I sat on a table and there was like four people there, like the production, um, well, the people doing the production and like a couple others. Yeah. And then this mate, he come in like halfway through eating like sushi or something. And then we was all joking about it. And he turned out to be like the head of MTV or something like right. that. Yeah. And I think and he's because- just like directing yeah, Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think because I was quite relaxed with the interview, like mm. they, they liked it. And um, I remember when I came out, I realized because there was like a few people coming in and there was somebody before me as well. I was like, oh, okay, it's quite a big thing. I thought it was just- like just me, you know, <laughs> they just asked me to do it. Um, and then I got a call back and it was like, yeah, we want to have you. I was like, okay, yeah, that's, that's really good. So and chill. Yeah. yeah. Then I had to do like a, like a psych interview and stuff, which I've never had before, which was a bit weird. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was such a long process, like process to get into it. And then there was filming for about six weeks, I think in secret location in London. Um, and yeah, like that, that was it. And yeah. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was good. I mean, some parts were a bit long, but I've done kind of like film stuff before, like mm. before tattooing and stuff. I used to do like TV adverts and like extra work. And I actually, I was a dancer before. So um, oh, did shit. stuff with that. Yeah. Yeah. India, international Bollywood dancing, stuff like that. Was it? Yeah. Was yeah. it Bollywood? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe you have to try and find a way of combining the coffee with the Bollywood. And oh yeah. There's always a way. One yeah. whole thing. That's <laughs> yeah. it. There is always a way. I exactly. love that, man. There's um. Yeah, it's cool. Bro, it's been yeah. it's been great to kind of sit down with you and, and yeah, yeah. just like, just even for a minute. I'm sure we'll catch up a bit later on when we're at Brighton. Definitely. Um, just talk to me then quickly about um, plans for the future, I guess. Um, and yeah, where people where people can find you. Well, like what's gonna what's next for you in the next five years? So I think um five years is such a long time. Like, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even it know. Is that five yeah, year question, but that, that is a long time. Um no, I think at the moment I'm just kind of seeing how things go and stuff. Like yeah. I'm happy here uh, where I am. I'm, I'm happy not to have the stress of managing people. So mm. I'll let, you know, other people deal with that for now. And I think just kind of rebrand and, and grow and kind of evolve what I'm doing now because I felt like at the beginning it was kind of like going backwards in a way. Like I've I've had a studio, I've had all this stuff, it was successful and then, I felt like it was all wiped away and I had to start from zero again. But um, people said, no, it's not really that. It's just kind of like you got sidetracked and, you know, it's just kind of, again, finding yourself, finding your lane, um, evolving with how things are changing, especially like with like social media side and stuff, like so much has changed in the past yeah. like a few years. Um, so I'm just trying to adapt and also give a bit more of myself um, like to the industry and stuff and just network and meet people like yourself. Um, also want to shout out Susie as well, because she's the one that, you know, said to speak to you and get in contact. Okay. And I think that was just through like conversations that we were having here. Mm. Um, so I think without meeting, well, without being here, without talking to Suze, without, you know, all that stuff, again, mm. I would have never been at this point. So I think it's just kind of collaborating with people, networking, you know, um, Oh man, it's so important. Yeah, exactly. It's so important. Um, yeah, collaborations are, I think, are so important in this industry. And I think it's important to remember that, do you know what I mean? We're all like in the same boat. And Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, I just love kind of meeting people and bigging people up because, I, do you know what I mean? I, I can just respect and, and, and I can appreciate what it's taken to get to that point, you know? Yeah, and I think um, you limit yourself if you're just enclosed in your own little space like it's good to do that sometimes but if you're doing that then at least go out and guest in places as well yeah and just like i owe a lot to the industry so i want to give back and uh, yeah it's good that you've got that attitude as well man it's sick yeah definitely um as mentioned in a previous video silicon foregrip system but they're japanese steel and they've got a needle stabilization system as well nice and smooth really accurate and just nice and strong and sharp 
Yeah, yeah, cool. This is probably a good time for me to give you the guest question sure. for you from the pre previous guest. Okay. Um, it's quite a deep one, but it's it's good. The goals you have, are they your goals or are they what people expect you to have? Oh, definitely mine, I would say, because, um, you know, if you're doing stuff just to please other people, then you can just constantly be, you know, frustrated with, with mm -hmm. everything. And, you know, I feel like, you know... Uh, when you've reached that point, like whatever you're trying to achieve or whatever, um, you know, once you've achieved that, then you're, you're much more comfortable within yourself. Yeah. And that kind of, um, again, like I said, waffle on, but it kind of goes back to when I used to, like when I first got in, in the, into the industry, uh, my tattoo name was actually Sour Grapes Tattoo. What was that? Yeah. And that was basically because I wanted to, do something different that people would remember and, and actually question. And people would say, oh, why sour grapes? And I was like, oh, it's like the old Aesop fable where um, the fox is trying to reach the grapes in the tree and he's trying to reach it, but then he just gets a bit salty because he can't reach it. And he's like, oh, I didn't want it anyway. So it's basically that trying what to- saying comes from? Yeah, exactly. So he's, he's trying to like reach that unattainable goal. Mm. And um, with me, it's kind of like, I would always be trying to reach that unattainable goal, but I would never get there because I'm always trying to do more and more. And when I do get close, then I just stretch it higher and higher. Um, so it's just constantly going on. Mm. Um, but then I felt at some point, I can't remember when it was, maybe like the second year of having my studio, I felt like I outlived that name. And I felt like I had to kind of put my own, my own name out there. So that's why... I then became, or just put out Mr. J Best. Yeah, a bit of a reinvention. Yeah, a bit more personal as well. I feel like sometimes you know when it's the right time and you know when you've evolved and when you've reached a certain point that you're kind of comfortable with uh, in success, I guess. Yeah. yeah. What, I mean, what is then success to you and do you feel like you've achieved it? So I think success is um, when you feel comfortable, I would say. And yeah, I think I have achieved it at times, but... Again, I don't allow myself to be too comfortable because mm. then you'll just become stagnant and you need to, I think, constantly evolve. Yeah, yeah. 100%. So important. Yeah, yeah. Do you have anything <laughs> that you want to want to know from the from the next guest? <sighs> so I had a few questions. Uh, how a few do options. I, how, do I, how, do I, <laughs> how do I put it? Um, have you ever had a situation when you're tattooing someone, you're concentrating and stuff and there's this awkward smell that comes <laughs> as if someone's farted or something like that and yeah. and if it has happened how do you deal with it okay i thought you were going to say if it has happened i want the name <laughs> yeah <laughs> no no, no no but i feel how like how do you deal with it it's something that maybe happens but no one spoke about yeah. until this day yeah so it's like yeah, farting in public it, and it it's yeah, just so it needs to be addressed <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> yeah we need Tattoo to have etiquette with it. Yeah. i think it's great <laughs> love that bro um yeah sweet mate it's been really good yeah. i've enjoyed just kind of having a chat with you like i said i could just sit here for hours man yeah, it's, cool. uh, it's been good i appreciate um, it yeah man thank you for being a part of it um and i look forward to seeing where you go with it man keep just keep doing what you're doing and um just obviously i know you will like just with that determination to perfect your stuff yeah um, i think one last thing as well um that's one thing i learned as well like when you're so driven it's good to be that driven as well but a piece of advice i would give is that actually live in the moment sometimes and appreciate what you've actually uh, succeeded in rather than just going forward all the time mm. live in the moment as well mm. yeah. nice one bro thank <laughs> you <mate. laughs> cheers definitely man um, sick yeah that was cool really enjoyed that yeah um, we've got one last thing to do oh okay which is now a tradition cool for season two oh I've got to drop it on you right. so what we're doing is a drawing challenge we've got a, a piece of A5 paper you've got a Bic you've got a HB a 2B and a half mil fine liner and to make matters even more difficult for you I'm going to be giving you some quick fire general knowledge questions and I'm going to give you three minutes to draw, draw a traditional blue whale three, three two one go cool so what was no sorry vanilla comes from what flowers uh a vanilla pod <laughs> <laughs> Which country invented gin? Gin? Gin. No clue. Aduki, Borlotti and Cannellini are types of what? Uh, no clue either. Pasta? The needles off the western tip of the Isle of Wight are an example of what type of geographical feature? Uh, 
um, let's just say a tectonic plate. <laughs> These are difficult, isn't it? Which <laughs> technique did Vincent van Gogh use to paint his sunflowers? Uh, painterly strokes. Name the composer behind the soundtracks of The Lion King, Inception, and Pirates of the Caribbean. Hans Zimmer. Who said this famous quote, if you can't handle me at my worst, then you sure as hell don't deserve me at my best? Uh, Elton John. How did Roxy and Ronnie die in EastEnders? Um, they walked into Coronation Street. Uh, the letterbox of 10 Downing Street in London has an inscription that reads, First Lord of what? you got um, just under two minutes left. Mordor. <laughs> How many figures do Simpson, fingers sorry, do Simpsons characters have? Four. Arctic Monkeys took the indie storm, scene by storm in 2005 with the now classic I Bet You Look Good on the Dance Floor, but what was the first line of the song? Uh, hey. <laughs> what is the name of the Greek <laughs> dip consisting of yogurt and cucumber? I actually had this tonight. Uh, is it tzatziki? Which animal name means river horse? Uh, um, fox. In which English county is the town of Stevenage? Uh, how, how are you getting on? Midlands. We've got, mid, we've got a bit of a blue whale going on. To the tip, how tall is the Eiffel Tower? Um, I would say at least one mile. Which bird can fly backwards? Uh, um, I can't Pigeon. Remember. Is it? Alberta know. is a province of which country? Say again. Alberta is a province of which country? Portugal. What's the longest running soap opera in the UK? Uh, Emma Dale. What is Lady Gaga's real name? Gwen. Who was the only British Prime Minister to be assassinated? Uh, well, not Boris. Not Boris, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, let's say Gordon Brown. 35 <laughs> seconds left. What's the name of James Corden's character in Gavin and Stacey? Smithy. Who famously said, you must be the change you wish to see in the world? Oh, um, 20 seconds Gandhi. left. What year did Rihanna achieve global success with the mega hit Umbrella? I want to say 2005. Sofia is the capital of which country? Uh, I know this as well. Five, uh, um, four, three. Don't know, two. let's say Denmark. Oh, that's it, time's up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so basic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's got you got like a bit of a rope thing going on. Yeah, I started that's, it. Yeah, that's a real trad thing. I wasted man. time making it thick. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, man. Yeah. That's sick. Solid <laughs> composition entry. Nice one, man. It's been good fun. Appreciate yeah. it. How did the other ones do? Yeah, did, yeah. well, I'll show you in a minute. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the podcast this week. Don't forget to hit the bell icon and the follow button wherever you listen to your podcasts. And don't forget to head over to YouTube and hit that subscribe button as well. Really helps the podcast grow. And thank you so much for all the support so far. I'm Alex Lloyd, and this is a 21st Century Tattoo. Thanks for listening. It's cool, man. I could literally just keep talking to you, for Yeah. <laughs> um, I know I waffle off onto other things sometimes. No, but no, yeah, yeah. no, it's sick. It's cool. I'm enjoying it.